Good morning. This is Dwayne Hubbard. I'm the music minister at First Methodist Church. So good to be with you for our Methodist Moments, our Sunday School Lessons from the International Series. I'm actually, as you're listening to this, on my way back from San Antonio. The Panola Band and Choir have been down there for our All-State Convention. This is, uh, I'm recording this on Monday and uh, anticipating a great week, great Saturday, a great Sunday, and joining with y'all on that Sunday for our Methodist Moments. We could spend a year learning about prayer, couldn't we? And we, we'd we never quite figure it all out. Now, consider how remarkable it is that we can even pray at all. God didn't have to make it possible for us to pray, but God gives us the ability to pray. And that wasn't enough. God gives us not only ability, but the desire to pray. And this cha this lesson challenges us to look at one aspect of prayer, praying so that others will see us pray. Ooh, this problem goes back as far as prayer itself, doesn't it? And Jesus would have none of it. Recall the parable Jesus told in Luke chapter 18 about a Pharisee and a tax collector? Bet you do. He said a certain Pharisee went out to pray and said, Thank you, God, that I'm not like everyone else. I give a tenth of everything I receive. He called attention to his prayer and his fasting and his charity, his almsgiving. But the tax collector in Jesus' parable stood at a distance and wouldn't even look up to heaven. He prayed, God, show mercy on me, a sinner. Two different attitudes in prayer. And Jesus said the tax collector went home justified and the Pharisee did not. So this is our second lesson about prayer. Um, but today's lesson focuses most on our attitude when praying. Not necessarily about how we stand or what we say, but mostly about who the audience is. Who is the audience when we pray? This is from the Sermon on the Mount, so it Mount, so it's it's Matthew five, six, and seven. And we're gonna pick it up in the middle of the sermon, chapter six. Verse number one. In verse one, Matt, uh, Jesus says, Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Wow. No reward. So, Jesus has taught the Beatitudes, chapter five, and Matthew here in Matthew chapter 6, he changes his focus to something else. So, in this spot, Jesus turns his attention on the legal experts. Now, he confronted several of their behaviors that were not um, consistent with the spirit of the law. Jesus was a lot about the spirit of the law. What does the law really mean? What does it really say? In this lesson, we're going to look at those practices and what Jesus has to say about them. But first, we need to make a little clarification, don't we? The CEB, the English Bible, translates the opening words as, be careful that you don't practice your religion. Now, the Revised Standard Version says, beware of practicing your righteousness. That's different, isn't it? Some may say, be careful not to practice your piety. I think it's getting closer and closer to probably what Jesus is meaning. Righteousness is probably the most literal translation, but religion and piety, they're not wrong. That the Jewish righteousness had three basic aspects that we need to know. Almsgiving, giving to charity, prayer, and fasting. So we can see 
Charity is addressed in Matthew 6, verses 2 through 4. Prayer in verses 5 through 8. And fasting in verses 16 through 18. So, what does Jesus say about us giving to charity? Let's see. Verse 4, he says, Whenever you give to the poor, that's charity, whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may get praise from people. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may give to the poor in secret. Your father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. Jesus is making an interesting statement here. He's saying, uh, if you're looking for praise from people, it's not that you won't get that reward. It's just that's the only re reward. So our attitude is important. Our purpose, our agenda is important. Wow. So what about when we pray? Remember our statement about Jesus and his audience? As Jews, they knew they were expected to give to the poor, pray, and fast. He expects us to do that as well. Did you know that? Let's see what it says. When you pray, don't be like hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and all the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, pray to your father who is present in that secret place. Your father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. Notice, he's making that connection to doing things in secret and that the father who sees what you do in secret will reward you for almsgiving in secret and for prayer in secret. You know, so Jesus doesn't just have expectations of what, we'll, what we will do, of what we will do. What will we do? Give to the poor, charity, pray, and fast. He expects us to do that. But it's not his expectations of what we will do. It's his expectations of how we will do these things. So what are we expected to say when we pray? What in the world are we expected to, to, to say? Huh? Well, he's got a few things about that too. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them because your father knows what you need before you even ask. God knows what we need. I think Jesus is saying, remember your audience. Who is our audience? We pray to an audience of one. And that one is the only one that matters. So guess what? Big words or lots of words are probably not going to impress the creator of all languages. There's not a word you're going to come up with that, Jesus, that God hadn't already heard and didn't create in the beginning. You're, you're not going to impress him with your vocabulary. And you're not going to impress him with the sound of your voice. Because he invented all of that. We are speaking to the one who created us. God already knows. He knows everything about us. Number of hairs on our head, which I hope he is counting because they're getting fewer and fewer. The days in our lives, the beat of our heart, the breathing of our lungs, the thoughts in our mind, the words on our tongue. He is the author of all of that. So, then, then comes the question, why pray at all? 
If he knows everything, why pray? We pray because God wants a relationship. He wants to hear our voice. He wants to hear our praise and longing and needs in our own unique voice. The words I pick will be different from the words someone else picks. And he wants to hear my pleading in my words. He wants to hear our wants and our needs. He wants it to be personal, meant just for him. John Wesley had a lot of thoughts about why we do these things, why we do the things that specifically that Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount. John Wesley called it piety. It's kind of an old-fashioned word, isn't it? So, John Wesley came up with some things about piety. He defined these acts of piety as practice of prayer, worship, receiving the sacraments, fasting, and holding people accountable for their Christian growth. We engage in these undertakings. Wesley believed we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We're working with the Holy Spirit. He believed that these means of grace, is what he called them, means of grace, change our hearts, help us stay connected to Christ. Turn us daily toward God. Allow us to receive that life-restoring work of God's grace through the Holy Spirit. Along with those acts of piety, Wesley added acts of mercy. The ministries of compassion, service, justice. Acts of mercy re relieve suffering, feed the hungry, visit the imprisoned, heal the sick. We need both. We need piety and mercy as ingredients in our spiritual lives. Martin Atkins, who's the general secretary of the British Methodist Church, says, acts of piety and acts of mercy are like two wings of a bird. Without either one, we can't fly. Following Christ involves praying hands and dirty fingernails. I like the way that sounds, don't you? Now, Jesus didn't forbid public prayer or tell us not to give money to our church or to charity. He's not saying that. He expects both of those things. He also didn't tell us to only pray in secret. Remember, Jesus spoke out loud when he taught the Lord's Prayer. He taught it out loud. He prayed out loud when he was on the cross to his Father. Jesus only cares about why. Why? Are we performing like the hypocrites? Or communicating intimately with the one who created us and saves us? Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for this lesson that teaches us it's not the how, it's the why. It's not... Uh, the words that are said, it's the audience of one that we're speaking to. So Lord, help us to look at you as our only audience that matters, as the one that loves us, that knows us, that is waiting patiently, sometimes impatiently, for us to reach out and share our wants and needs, our praise and our worship each and every day. Help us to pray without ceasing and help us to pray the way that you want us to pray. In your name we pray, amen. I'll see you next week in person for another of our Methodist Moments. Goodbye. <laughs>